Hello, I'm Steph from iDriver Classic and today we are looking at this 2.8 litre Capri from 1986. 1 1.9 million Capris were sold across the entire lifespan and it's said to be the car that you always promised yourself, which is quite handy really because this has recently come up for sale with bid and classics auctions. This is only 35,000 miles from new and I thought if we're going to test out a Capri of this era why not test out a 2.8 and why not test out a low mileage example because it's probably going to be as close to how it would have been from new as possible. Now we've got quite a few Fords coming up on the channel actually and it's quite exciting to add a Capri into the mix. We haven't done a Capri for many years and so in today's video we're going to take you for a walk around the outside of the car, talk to you the history of the Capri, tell you a little bit about this 2.8 and then we're going to get up close and personal, show you the controls inside before taking you out on a test drive. As always with an iDriver Classic video if you have any questions drop them in the description box below but before any of that let's click into a message from our sponsor and then crack on with the video. Life's too short to drive something boring, so make sure you do something about it this year. I would begin your journey on the Bidding Classics Auctions website. They've got some fantastic cars up for grabs. They've got everything from pre-war stuff right through to the 90s and early 2000s stuff with an incredible mix of different marks, models and price brackets as well. Now let's get back to that video and I'll show you what we're doing today. The story of the Capri begins way back in the 60s when Philip T. Clark, who designed the Ford Mustang, was tasked with creating a coupe which would appeal to the European market in the same way that the Mustang did to Ford's American customer. Now I always think the 60s is such an interesting time in Ford's history because in the beginning of the decade you've got very separate arms of the business in both England and in Germany but by the end of the decade not only are the two countries working well together but they're producing cars which have to equally appeal to both markets. Although you do see both countries using different engines to suit home markets but perhaps that's a deep dive for a Ford history video later on. In terms of appeal and affordability, the Capri wasn't a completely new design and what I mean by that is, is that the first generation took mechanicals from the Cortina and unlike some manufacturers that really revelled in keeping cars unaffordable, unless somebody was in their target demographic, Ford decided that they'd give the Capri as big as potentially possible market share by giving a wide variety of engines and corresponding price points. However, you might be thinking that Ford didn't spend much by borrowing something from something they already had out in the market. Well, not so, because the design which had first appeared on drawing boards in 1965 had a £20 million investment, so it really had to work. And Ford did it quite well because they made sure that the cars were in production when they first unveiled it. They made sure that dealerships had one on every Ford court. They got it quite swish in a way that perhaps competitors like British Leyland perhaps weren't getting quite spot on. Now Ford priced it from £890 for the Mark 1, which meant that the fun fastback was in the grasp of the many, not just for the chosen few that could afford the top engine choice. That first generation ran until 1974 and it was then replaced by the second generation which featured that shortened nose, increased space within the cabin which I do talk about later on as a plus point even in the Mark III and the clamshell style rear hatch and folding rear bench seat. Now that folding rear bench seat is a really big thing in 70s and 80s cars. People really loved it, it was a huge selling point. And in addition to this the suspension was softened, larger discs added and an auto box and power steering added as options on higher spec. So you maybe didn't necessarily get it if you go for the bottom rung but on the higher specs it's definitely there for the grab. Ford also streamlined the engine range in the Mark II. So you see the 1.3 as the base and that 3 litre Essex V6 as the range topper. So buyers get two very different experiences um, on top and bottom of the range but they're essentially buying into the same car. And then finally we get to what we're testing today which is the Mark III. Now the Mark III was introduced in 1978 but unlike the early 20 
£22 million budget for the Mark I, the revamp for the Mark III was a lot more restrained because they only had £480,000 to play with, which is perhaps why you don't see them reinvent the wheel for the Mark III. And it's more of a facelift across the Mark II. But I really hate when people say, oh, it's only a facelift because I think they've done it quite well and they've spent the money very savvily because look at this car. It's a really attractive facelift and it takes it quite well into the 78 market. So you've got those quad lamps, which people absolutely love. You've got the new wings, the new bonnet, which comes over and gives it a really mean front to it. It looks cool. The bumpers, you say goodbye to the chrome and we come into this new era because chrome is very much that 50s and 60s thing, whereas the 70s you start to see manufacturers get rid of it. And you also see some new interior options and some new colourways. So it really gives it a modern twist for the time of the launch. And also limited was the engine refresh. So options are carried over from the Mark II, although the Mark the 1.3, which is used on the Mark II, is tweaked, and that's to improve durability and reliability because it was a bit of a, well, it was having a few problems. So you see new cross flow head, and then you've still got, so at the time of the Mark III launch, you still get that three litre Kent engine. However, it's ousted really early on, and I think it's 8182. I think 81, but some people say 82. It's replaced with the Granada's 2.8 V6. And if you're wondering why they did that, it was to get round some of those emissions requirements. Production comes to a close in 1986. And it's one of those things that Ford kept it going a little bit longer than they thought they would because essentially people were still loving it, but sales were dwindling off. So it comes to a close in 1986, which is the year that this example was sold. Now, this particular example we're testing here today is a lovely one. It's got 35,000 miles from new. It's in remarkably original condition. I'm going to point out some bits that I think really add to that buzz later on when we're looking a bit closer. And I think that when you get behind this, and you'll see later on from the back seat, you still get that same thrill behind the wheel as you did 37 years ago. There are a few exterior details I really like on this particular car uh, that I wanted to draw your attention to. So with it being quite an original car, nobody's taken out the original dealership sticker, which I really like that they've kept in. And also it's still running on its original dealer plates with that beautiful, I think it's called Cirque font. And I just really like the fact that that's still on the car. And the other thing is, is in an upcoming video, I'm gonna be looking at a Ford Sierra. And in the brochure, it talked about commitment to security because Fords of this era were very highly stolen essentially and it was actually in a home office report from the 1980s and 1990s that in fact the Capri was one of the most stolen vehicles of its time and as part of Ford's commitment to security they said that if you bought from a Ford main dealer they would etch your number plate onto all the glass and I think the light lenses as well just to try and help it stop it being stolen so anyway coming back inside here with this being an 86 i had an inkling that we might end up in a situation where it felt like the car was on its last throws or dying breath because quite often you do get into last production vehicles and they can feel a bit like that but i feel like the commitment to quality as well is as keenly felt in this as it is in earlier capris well really most things of the 80s you get in and they really feel their age but in this I still think it feels like quite a clean design inside it doesn't feel sometimes you see some of that color-coded plastic and it can feel quite dated whereas in this the lines are fresh it's quite clean it's uncluttered and it holds its own in the market so for me this is a really pleasing design now you've got all this space down here and I think again sometimes you get in sports vehicles and they can feel and this is really where it's sat in that space where it fits in that sporting space and you feel quite cramped whereas in this not so I think it feels like you've got a lot of room now this really helps you see how this dash slopes down into the footwell this gives you what feels like additional space inside with the glove box fitting squarely into that. Coming in front of us here, we don't have too much going on in this dash. You've got this stereo coming down into the heater controls, coming down into four buttons. So that's your fog, 
screen demist, your rear wiper, which looks quite cool by the way, as you can see there. And then you've got your rear screen, heated rear screen as well. Now talk quite a lot about this really nice design inside and how clean it is. And I think this is quite clean as well, because watch this. So as you fold down this, instead of having your ashtray on show and your cigar lighter, it just folds up and folds away neatly. So if you ever, never actually need those bits, they don't have to necessarily be out. Coming in front of us, we've got a really nice clean set of dials and gauges. And what I like about this is you're not looking at I'll tell you what I really don't like, digi dashes, and I think they go wrong quite quickly. With this, it's all still your standard. Now, up top, you've got your amateur coming down into your oil pressure, over into a rev counter, a speedo with an inbuilt trip clock, a fuel gauge, and a temperature gauge exactly what you need no more no less really and then you've probably noticed this little keypad we talked about how often these were stolen this is actually a security feature which is still very much in use on the car i'm not going to be demonstrating how that works today because that would compromise the safety of the car we come down into here and you'll be able to see we've got that five speed box i think they changed over from the four into the five speed i think in around 84 so they introduced the 2.8 to replace the three liter in 81 82 and then they swapped the box over from a four speed into a five with the, i think it's, is it the slip diff and that comes in in 84. So we've got that here. So this is one of the great things about going for something that's at the end of the range uh, in terms of its lifespan is that you end up with a car where all the kinks have been ironed out and you end up with a really great car that encompasses all the best bits usually. So coming through from that, we've got the armrest and uh, keep fiddling with this to get it open. <laughs> So as you can see, that opens up a few trusty fuses and bits in there. We like a prepared owner. And that is pretty much everything as you would expect it to be. We've also got the three stalks as well. We've talked a lot about this. We're going to talk about this in the upcoming Sierra video as well. As you can see, that runs over from indicators. Have a listen to this horn, by the way. So funny. <laughs> And it runs over into your lights and your windscreen wipers. So everything's there. It's all deliciously simple. But the real magic in this car isn't the design inside. It's when we go out for a drive. Because honestly, I've become a different person inside this. Oh my goodness. Let me start it up. So first of all, have a listen. So I'm just going to have to cut the camera because there's a security thing I need to do. And I'll get it started. You already know that you're going to be trouble behind the wheel. Have a listen. Good God, that sounds amazing. I'm going to shoot it from the back as well. Have a listen and then we'll pop on the drive. Right, let's go on an adventure. Now the most frustrating thing about this Capri for me is that it's capable of over 130 miles per hour. It does zero to 60 in around eight seconds. But you know what? You can only ever go as fast as the car in front of you. And they call this the English Mustang. But let me tell you now, I already know that our American friends across the water with their Mustangs will be able to do far more than we can because their roads are a lot more set up for it. Roads in Great Britain nowadays, probably a lot more so than 37 years ago when this was sold, are congested. The road surface is like that of the moon, which means that that stiff suspension probably wasn't as noticeable as it is today on these disgusting roads that are full of potholes. But because the seats are remarkably well upholstered, and I don't know if you spotted it, but I'm just going to revisit it now whilst we're on test drive. I know that it's only on 35,000 miles from you, but gosh, haven't these seats held up well? They're very well upholstered. They are put together nicely so that even though that suspension is quite tough and you might be watching on the camera at home and it probably looks like it's 
it would look like it looks quite jarring it was coming up through the seats but because there's a lot of padding you don't feel it as though you might feel it in something say like an MGB which means that you can kind of put up with it a little bit more and the tolerance is a little bit higher now as we cruise along I wish we were heading out onto motorways today because I can tell that this car has so much more to give than maybe what we can get out of her changing gear I don't know if you can see at home it'll take you up into fifth the gear change on this is so nice and that's something I'm going to say actually is that Fords I think of pretty much any era pre-2000 because my experience of Fords post-2000 is very limited so I'm not able to really comment on it all the boxes are always really nicely put together so much so more so than competitors even if we go back to the column change era column change forts are always in my opinion up there with the really nice stuff like the hillman humbers um, for how well they change through and the gearbox as you can see in this is no exception let me come down easy enough now i expected from my limited experience of capris and i've driven a very early one hello we keep getting all these waves today now i've driven an early capri and it all felt very heavy on the nose end and it meant that when you were driving it you felt like you were constantly correcting yourself to really keep the car in a straight line with this it feels well balanced well put together and easy enough this for me is just such an enjoyable test drive recently driven this and I've driven a Granada and both of those have stood out to me as my favourites of the Fords I've tested. Now I thought I wasn't really a Capri gal after testing that early one and not really liking it but this if you've ever driven an early one handles like a completely different car. I much prefer this, I find this much easier to drive. But what are my criticisms? Well the driving experience in this including the gear change, the seating position, it's all exactly where you'd expect it to be and where you need it to be. Even for somebody like me who's quite short, I think this is a really enjoyable drive. And I don't feel like I'm sitting too low down either. However, there's a couple of things that I think Ford could have added on to uh, make this a bit more enjoyable. So number one is, is, and I know this sounds like such a small thing, but in that Granada, we had electric windows. I feel like we could have put it into this. We know they've got the technology, pop it into this. It would have just made it a little bit more enjoyable. Other than that, I can't think of much. It's such an easy and enjoyable car to drive. And you know what? The one thing you do feel is when you get behind it, you feel like a different person, which is what I think some of the appeal might be. Because usually I'm quite a sedate driver. I'm used to driving my little 60s and 70s saloons at quite sensible speeds. The minute I got into this, I just wanted to put my foot down and go wild, which might also explain why they're quite stolen as well. Because I think if you're gonna risk going to prison for a joyride, pick something that's worth joyriding. And I'll tell you what, this is definitely something worth joyriding. Ooh. As we come round, I'm going to start taking her back to HQ. From the noise of that exhaust note to how you feel as the driver when you're in the driving seat, this is an exceptional driving experience. I've much, do you know what? I've enjoyed this much more than some of that high end stuff like the Bentleys and Rolls Royces because you just come alive and you get to enjoy it. So yes, I'd love to take this out on a long country drive through country roads. I imagine it'd be far more exciting than popping around the roads, the back roads of West Yorkshire. But I've enjoyed it nonetheless. I hope you've enjoyed driving, coming with me for the test drive experience. Uh, but until next Sunday, when we're looking at something else, which I think also, spoiler, is another Ford, take care and drive safely.